Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Growing Up with Godzilla. My name is Donnie Winter, and this is my show where I have conversations with fellow Godzilla fans about how they've grown with the character and the franchise since, for many individuals, since they were kids, for some of the individuals, pretty recent. It's just really interesting to learn about how they've experienced this journey of being a Godzilla fan from start to now. Tonight, I am particularly excited to have a good friend of mine joining me who is a writer, podcaster, editor. Honestly, this individual, I was telling this to him earlier, I aspire to the level of output that he creates. So I am very excited to have the wonderful Nathan Marchan joining us this evening. How are you, my Hey-o! friend? Hey-o! <laughs> Sorry, I jumped the gun there a little bit. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. I lo- I need uh-huh. someone to rival this obnoxious energy that I have, honestly. Uh, that could be dangerous, sir. You, uh, If you unleash me, <laughs> I, I don't know if you're prepared for what you're going to get. <laughs> Nathan, also, Nathan Martin unleashed. <laughs> uh, unleashed. I mean, if you listen to my podcast, that's basically me cranked to 11. You're getting maybe an eight right now. I'm, you know, I don't want to go too big. Right but now. I lo- like the energy in your <laughs> podcast is so fun though, and I absolutely love it. And yeah. I like, and and I'm, we're gonna be gushing about that here in just a bit because I'm really <laughs> excited to talk about the content that we create. Uh, yes. So, and also, there's one, there's one other thing that I do that you that you left off. I'm also a voice actor. Damn it. Yeah. Well, yeah. well I'm, I'm not surprised with that podcasting voice. Of course. Like, like that's stunning. Yeah. I, love I it. do voice acting on the, on the monster and film vault, which is my flagship show. And I play one of the bad guys as a regular cast member on power Rangers, the audio drama from Scyther podcast. That sign me up. That sounds amazing. I'm going to have to go <laughs> check that out. Do you want to want me to tell you who, which bad guy I am? I mean, it's a little please, spoilerific. Please do. Do you remember Rita's brother? <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Just, I'm Rito. <laughs> Rito. I... <laughs> chef's kiss that's amazing <laughs> that is amazing how i got that is a little bit of a funny story too so oh my god okay so now you have and, to and michael my co-host on the power trip michael hamilton he is so jealous <laughs> oh yeah my i adore michael so now you have to tell me the story because i'm <laughs> curious as hell <laughs> well it actually goes back to it was a few weeks before christmas last christmas now michael and i had been listening to the podcast uh, to power rangers the audio drama for about about a year or so at that point i actually found out about it through a friend of mine who's also a podcaster named chris cook and i introduced michael to it and we've been listening to it and carl dutton is the one who created that writes it edits directs and all that fun stuff his other ongoing show right now is x-men so he has an x-men audio Mm. drama as well he's also done an adaptation of batman the long halloween he did a star trek uh, audio drama trying to write, he's done several so this is one of his ongoing ones right now so i just i i was in one of his facebook groups centered around scyther podcasts and i would occasionally see things pop up post on there where he says hey i'm looking to cast such and such so i just decided one day you know what i'm gonna give this a try so i just put a comment in the group one day like i said a few weeks before christmas and i said hey you uh Doing any auditions right now? Shot in the dark, you know? Oh. And he said, actually, yeah, I need to cast two characters for the second season finale of Power Rangers, the audio drama. So he said, I'll message you because I don't want to give out spoilers. Okay, fine. Sends me the, the script. There was two scripts. He needed some bit parts filled for the penultimate episode, which I did do. It was like it was a, a, a prison guard. A, a TV reporter, and I can't remember what the other one was. I think it was, those are the two that I remember. And then he also said, I have two major characters in this one. And it was his version of Master Vile. If you remember Master Vile, you know, it was How Rita's dad. Master Vile. Yeah, yeah, Master Vile. Or Rito. And I decided to go with Rito because I'm like, I don't think I have the right voice for Master Vile. So I thought, you know what? I'll take a shot in the dark. I'll do Rito. Well, the thing about Rito is I wish I could remember the original voice actor's name. He is no longer with us, unfortunately. I found out he actually died, I think, in 
I think about 10 years ago or so, which is so oh, funny because wow. the other cast members who play like the Rangers and things, they've talked mm -hmm. about going to conventions and meeting the original actors who played their characters. And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> 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 I have the only Rito left. So uh, the thing you have to remember about that guy is that he gave Rito a bit of a Texas twang. <laughs> Yes, which was a little bit of grit, a little bit of a of. Texas twang, and I am too Midwest to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I live a little too far north to pull the Texas twang off. So I'm like, well, what do I do? Well, it's like, well, I want to do the grit, but how do I get you know the you know the kind of the right grit, but also still kind of be within you know the kind of the same vocal range, the same ballpark as the original actor? I didn't want to necessarily go completely different with it. Some of the actors on the show have completely different voices compared to the originals and they own it. And that's great. But I wanted to at least have a bit of the original in there. So basically what you hear me do on the show is a toned down version of my Don Fry impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> it's just less gritty and the cadence is faster because <laughs> Don Don Fry talks a little slow. <laughs> I literally yeah. was about to ask you, I was like, I need to hear this Don Fry impersonation. <laughs> and it did not disappoint. <laughs> yeah. Here, here. I was like, there are two things you don't know about Earth. One is me, and the other is Godzilla. <laughs> if I tried lowering my voice that much, I'd shatter my pelvis or something. <laughs> A few months later, Michael Hamilton and I on the Power Trip, which is our Power Ranger podcast, we got Carl to come on the show and we interviewed him about making the audio drama because we were name dropping the audio drama at least once an episode at that point. So we brought him on and we had a pleasant conversation. I reminded Carl that I had sent him some audition audio. And then when we were finished recording and we wrapped everything up, he messaged me on Facebook. He said, oh, by the way, you got the part. <laughs> Bam. And I'm like, I did. <laughs> so Nathan, you like obviously I, I feel like you have a lot of uh, like numerous talents. And I really got like a bird's eye view of that when I have attended G Fest the past few years. Because I feel like you are very much involved at G Fest, especially as a panelist. Um, the the Kaiju Writers panel, for example, which I love attending every time I get to. So, like, there's a funny story how I got on that panel too. <laughs> oh God! Well, now I need to know that. Oh my gosh! So the first time, here's the crazy thing: I have been on at least one panel every year I've been to G Fest, including my first year where I technically signed up for nothing. I was just going there as a con goer. So I go. This is 2017. So I go there. And I wanted to, I saw the writer's panel on there and I talked to Neil Reby. Good, Neil's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he'll tell you, he'll tell you about this too. So, <laughs> so I go in there and I sit in the front row because I like sitting in the front row at panels. And it's within, you remember the old location where it was oh, yeah. in the, the downstairs panel room. It's tiny. Very, yeah, it's, very like, small it's a sardine room. can, you know? <laughs> so I go there and I sit there and you got to remember this. It's Saturday. It's day well, we had like a day zero on Thursday, but I've been, so I've been there since Thursday. So it's day two of the con middle of the afternoon. I am running on about maybe five hours of sleep and a heck of a lot of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and I overhear Neil talking with some of the other panelists. And they said that they had a guy who at the last minute couldn't make it. I don't even remember who it was, but he couldn't make it. So like, we need to figure out what to do. And then I just, decided to be a little bit funny i got my phone out went to this book's <laughs> amazon page <laughs> and i said hey i have a kaiju book on amazon and showed it to neil and neil said he said neil said yeah really is it showed it to him he's like huh get behind the table i'm like wait hold on we're starting Ooh. in five minutes and you Ooh. want me behind the table what is what is going on oh my god as an introvert that would be like my worst nightmare <laughs> I, I was just flabbergasted that i'm like i'm going to be on a panel now and so i went behind the table and you know how the panel works it's q a so it's not like i had to have anything prepared true, but true. yeah so that 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 helped otherwise i'd be like sir what <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like now that I think about it, I think that would take the pressure down a bit. The fact that yeah. it's like, yeah, 
you know, and then yeah. you know the panel goes on and neil talked to me afterward and said he was so impressed he put my name down to make sure he asked me to come back next year and then i've been on every every year since and then this year i took it over because neil didn't think he was going to be there and then he showed up anyway and i said it's still my panel <laughs> but it works like it worked so well that was honestly my favorite panel that i attended um oh thank you mostly because like it's just fun to nerd out with fellow writers you know mm -hmm. and and of course did we I, I think this year was the first year we formally met at g-fest which right. was really cool because we've kind of like adjacently run into mm -hmm. each other before and we've encountered one another on other streams with other um mm -hmm. with kim yeah with kim so i am genuinely curious about your journey as a godzilla fan talk to me about how it began like like how did it begin for you i've told this story a few times and it i actually started with it from what I can tell with a lot of my fellow fans a little bit later in life, by comparison, a lot of my friends, they were introduced to Godzilla at an exceptionally early age, you know, like grade school or even a little bit younger. I was probably in middle school when okay. I discovered, when I really started getting into it. Now I had knew who Godzilla was because of all the pop culture references. I knew at least generally who Godzilla was. And then there was this one day, you got to understand, I grew up without cable television, but my grandparents had cable television. So it was always exciting to go visit grandma and grandpa because they had cable TV. Right. So my family, it was our tradition to go visit. It was my mom's parents that we would go visit them every Sunday afternoon after church because, you know, so we can, you know, it was just a fun thing to do because they lived really close. And so I was there once we were there one Sunday. And I was flipping through channels. And one of the channels that was part of my grandparents' package was WGN. I don't know if you're familiar with WGN. I don't think so. It doesn't it is, it's actually a uh, It's actually a Chicago television channel. I'm not sure if it even exists anymore, if it does what it looks like now. I don't know. Right. It was just a, I think it was an independent television station based out of Chicago. It didn't oh, have okay. a network affiliate. And they were doing a thing. And that was just part included in there because we lived close enough to Chicago where it was within about three hours of Chicago. So I guess it was just included in the package. And they were doing a thing that day called Oh My Godzilla Weekend. <laughs> the sound effects have started. <laughs> you won't believe what was the one that they were showing. My first Godzilla film. I didn't get to watch all of it. I tuned in about halfway through. It was Terror of Mecha Godzilla. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, like, as a middle schooler, like, when you first watched that, like, how did you, like, absorb it? I was utterly fascinated. I, I really was. And I, I remember seeing, like, you know, like, the wild costumes for the aliens. And, uh, you know, you this is someone who was very well seasoned in things like Saturday morning cartoons and comic books and all of that. So it was clicking with those interests as i was watching it and the the creature design was was fascinating the you know the suitmation and the battles and everything i was i was enthralled and then after that i started looking into it's like where can i find more of these because i know there are more i need to see more of these right. and then i that started me collecting things like the vhs's and i started just looking for as many of them as i could get get my hands on and i wish i still had it but i am admittedly a practical collector when i upgrade to something i will typically part with the older version and now there's sometimes i kind of regret doing that I but do that i too. very yeah i very distinctly remember the first godzilla vhs's that i bought they were good times home video and the, i got a two pack that had king of the monsters 56 and no joke godzilla versus megalon what a pair to put together. i do rem i think i remember <laughs> that vhs set yep yeah uh, so i got that and uh i can't remember there were a couple other ones that i remember picking up pretty early but i remember that one very distinctly because that was the first that i got because my my instinct was if this is the first godzilla film i want to start at the beginning 
So I that was so I watched that one and then I went over to Megalon and I don't think it quite <laughs> registered with me just how diametrically different those movies were. <laughs> oh my god, going from like the existential threat of the nuclear specter to <laughs> the jet jaguar theme song at the end to a jet jaguar i have a weird appreciation of that goofy robot i admit (laughs) jet jaguar let's just say i know you've got a question about collecting later i have become mildly obsessed with collecting jet jaguar memorabilia (laughs) you know and i i I wonder if toho ever fathomed that jet jaguar of all characters (laughs) would have like this cult following <laughs> in the west <laughs> like because I, I don't think J- jaguar has that level of like fan love in japan it's definitely like a western thing for sure and i'm it makes me nerd out i just i always think about like well why is that why is that I- i've occasionally wondered that myself and i have ideas <laughs> as to why <laughs> well now i need to know I think part of it is nostalgia because that because Godzilla versus Megalon was one of the most widely seen Godzilla films for better or worse. And there's a whole discussion to get into about whether or not that was a good thing or not. So, you know, it's, it, so it's been seen a lot, but I think the, and also the design is just wild. Okay. <laughs> Jet Jaguar's oh, yeah. design is just nutty. I, I think it's good, but it is definitely very 70s tokusatsu nutty. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. But I, I think I've been thinking about it. I was like, does it go deeper than that? And honestly, I mean, that we've all seen Godzilla versus Megalon numerous times. We know it's a ridiculous movie and Jet Jaguar is powered by plot convenience. But I think what it boils down to for me with Jet, why he's resonating beyond just the surface level stuff And the ironic love of that movie is, I think it's just the simple heroism of Jet Jaguar. Oh, you know, yeah, I think I agree 100% with that. And I, to add on to that, I I, I watched it a month ago for the first Mm -hmm. time in like seven years, because it had been a long time. Because my my comfort films are the Heisei series or the Kiru saga, Mm -hmm. like those are mine. So I watched the show era. And I just remember as a kid falling in love with how Jet Jaguar became Godzilla's friend. And I think as kids, we all wanted to be Godzilla's friend. We all wanted to battle with him and, 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 and overcome these kaiju with him, you know, and do the right thing. And, and I just, it didn't click for me until I watched it. Like recently I was just like, wow, that's why I loved Jaguar so much. Cause I secretly wanted to be Jet Jaguar. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be honest. I I am putting some serious thought into trying to get a Jet Jaguar cosplay put together before G Fest next year. This needs to happen. <laughs> so okay, so obviously Godzilla versus Megalon really stood out for you. Um, and and you watched Terror of Mecha Godzilla, the original Godzilla film. Like, where did you branch out from there? And, and and what really cemented it for you as a Godzilla fan? I uh, well that early on, you know, in the very early days of the internet and things like that, it was hard to know how many there were and what releases there were. And because good lord, everybody and their dog's cousin was releasing these movies on yeah. whatever they could back then. Mm-hmm. So I was just trying to get my mitts on as many of them as I could. And found out some of them are just not available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for a while i like a lot of americans thought that it ended with biolante because that was the newest one i could find <laughs> oh because i wasn't going to g-fest and getting involved with the with the bootleggers you know and mm-hmm. finding the movies that were in japan that weren't available over here i did i had no idea so so i was just trying to snag up as many as i could most of it was showa obviously because the heisei films didn't get released until later but i remember reading about them and being interested in them and i think honestly once i was i had basically gotten what i thought was all of them at that point that uh, i was pretty i was in pretty deep and pretty i I was pretty solidified at that point and then seeing you know uh, not terror because godzilla 2000 in the movie theater Mm. Uh, yeah i saw godzilla 98 in the theater but does that count or not you know (laughs) yeah but i when i saw godzilla 2000 in the theater i that was i think that was one of the moments that really did it for me and i mean my fandom 
has you know it's gone through its peaks and valleys since then depending on my level of interest you know i you know things like undergrad happened and i have other interests as well you know you see the, the you know the superhero posters and the, my first you know geek fandom my first nerd fandom my first love in, uh, in fandom was star trek so you know so i so i, I mean, it, mm -hmm. so i've gone through like i said it's gone you know there's been some peaks and valleys with it but it's always been there right right so so obviously as it's grown for you over time like like what corners of the fandom did you find yourself gravitating toward? Um, like what, what did you start really doing once you involved yourself more in the fandom? I, I didn't really put it out into the world, but when I was in high school, you mentioned this a little bit before we started recording, I dabbled in fan fiction. <laughs> I wrote some fan fiction. Oh, <laughs> obsessed. Obsessed. Yeah. But I never really, I it, I never really shared it with the world. I wasn't putting it out on the internet or anything. But I was, oh, that I was, was that was how I practiced the craft of writing. A Fan lot of the fiction time. dot net, Toho mm -hmm. Kingdom, mm -hmm. Rodan's Roost. Mm -hmm. I tried to, yeah, I was obnoxious. But anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I cut my teeth doing fan fiction, kind of on my own. Right. And then uh, I started reading a lot of books on the series and learning more about that gaining knowledge and then obviously big part of why we're on here about five six years ago i started dabbling in godzilla and kaiju podcasting and then that opened a whole new door to me i started listening to a lot of podcasts and i started discovering youtubers who were into the a lot of the same things people like you know, like ryan collins the omni viewer the eventually you know kaiju kim Alyssa goji geek all of these people you know uh, making stuff about what they uh, what they love and then i decided to take the plunge and become a podcaster myself i had friends who were podcasters they had had uh, i had friends who had had me on their podcast so i had knew the i had experience as a guest but never as an actual you know host an actual podcaster myself until a few years ago Right, right. T so tell us about some of your podcasts, like, like names, themes, how, <laughs> like how long you've been doing them specifically and how you, like, how you feel they've grown. Cause that I'm always curious to hear about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I, uh, I was on a podcast uh, for about, about a year or so back in 2017. Uh, no, not 2017. It was 2018. Excuse me. It was 2018. And then I had to go to grad school. And I wasn't a, my first year of grad school, I, you know, I mentioned a little bit just how hectic the beginning of grad school was for me. It just yeah. changes all around for everybody, including the school. That's a whole story unto itself. So I had to, I had to, I stepped down and focused on my studies and just getting settled into my new normal right. for a while. But the bug was always there. It was always there. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to start my own podcast. I'm just going to, I'm going to do it myself. And then there's a funny story about, what solidified that I, I love this is I've got a lot of wild stories in case you happen to I'm here for it. <laughs> so I, I did remember this very distinctly. It was during spring break actually of my first year of grad school. Okay. 2019. There is a, an audio store here in Fort Wayne. That is, I think not only known around the country, I think it's internationally you known. It's called Sweetwater, Sweetwater mm -hmm. sound. Like every time a band comes through Fort Wayne, they have to visit Sweetwater because they probably use Sweetwater products <laughs> 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 or they buy from Sweetwater because they have to go visit. And Sweetwater is a wonderful place. It's mm -hmm. like it, 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 it's not just a retail store and an office and a distribution. There's like cool and fun things to do. They have a cafeteria. You know, it's they have everything. Wonderful. Basically, I went there because, you know, this microphone that you see here, I had it on the original podcast and I wanted to get something that I could use to do what I had done before on the other podcast and just connect this to my computer, record directly into Audacity. Right. So I went there and talked with one of the sales reps and I said, hey, I need something to connect this microphone to my computer. He's like, oh, we've got something. Let me talk, uh, introduce you to this guy. So he takes me over and introduces me to this very energetic young black guy who, and tells him, it's like, he's looking for something to do this. And I was like, oh, let me show you. And he goes over to the computer screen and he shows me this insane soundboard made by podcasters for podcasters. I am geeking out in the middle of this store. 
Okay. You got to understand. I'm not a musician. My sister's the musician. Sweetwater mm -hmm. is where she goes to geek out. I go to comic shops to geek mm -hmm. out. Okay. Or bookstores. And so I'm freaking out over this. And then I, and that, but then I saw the sticker. <laughs> I saw the price. I'm like, Ooh. I want it so bad, but that's a lot of money. And he says, we're doing a payment plan for this thing. If you get it right, okay. if you get it, it within the, like the next week or so or whatever it was, it was like, there was a time frame. Basically, if I got it relatively quickly, I could get it on a payment plan. I, I decided like, I need a, I need, I need a little bit of time before I make this because I knew if I get this soundboard, there's no turning back. It's too big of an investment. The podcast is going to happen. I went and I talked with one of my professors. I talked with a couple of my friends. And I, not to get all weirdly religious about this, but I'm like, I feel like God's telling me to do this podcast. My professor, said, yeah, I think so. And then I went and I took the plunge. <laughs> and then six months later, I launched the uh, the Monster Island Film Vault. <laughs> That's so like, because sometimes I, I do think that when we're on like the precipice of like a creative endeavor, sometimes I do feel like something bigger than us mm -hmm. kind of informs what we're doing mm -hmm. like like for me like i'm always like about like manifesting like oh well mm -hmm. this was a sign in, and that somehow it manifested into me mm -hmm. for you it was like that that voice that and mm -hmm. i think that's so cool when i listen to creators like have those moments like that because mm -hmm. i think those are very pivotal pivotal moments mm -hmm. the professor i had for those poetry classes i mentioned that, that i took he talked about stuff like that actually yeah, but, oh, yeah. about paying attention to the world around you and seeing what it's telling you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. So you've now been doing this podcast for th about three years, right? Three you've years. Done season. Th you're on season three. Season so, three. So, like, talk a little bit about like how like how do you feel about having produced this large body of work now? Because when you create a long form creation, like mm -hmm. I, like we take away different things than we right. normally do when we like produce something small and release it. Right. So like mm -hmm. what, what has been your takeaway from the whole experience so far? It's fun, but it's also work, <laughs> but it's very satisfying work. It's one of the, I know there's an adage in the writing world where people say, I don't like to write, but I like to have written. <laughs> <laughs> That, yes, which I think is a little fatalistic because I do think the process is fun, but the process isn't always fun. You know this. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So I understand that. So, you know, there's a lot of labor that goes into it. And I don't think I fully understood. I had an idea from my previous experiences with podcasting. I had I don't think I was entirely prepared for the amount of time it would take to make something good and there was a I, I have a not a bit I have an overachiever streak so there was a part of me that's just like I want to squeeze every single little thing out of this it has to be 101 not just 100 mm -hmm. and I've had to learn to relax a little bit because I'm either just going to stress myself out or it's going to take too long <laughs> so, oh yeah for sure so I've backed off a little bit the other thing about the film vault in particular <laughs> Yeah, I'm an academic. I have been called the Kaiju academic by a couple of people. <laughs> Which is an excellent title in my opinion. Uh, it is. That's an, that's an incredible title, actually. And <laughs> But I'm also a creative writer. I'm a novelist. I love fiction. You know, that was one of the first play things I wanted to learn how to write was I wanted to tell stories. Well, I decided to do a dabble in that a little bit for this podcast. It was originally just supposed to be a gimmick. Just a funny, silly little gimmick. And then it kept ballooning. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. It was incredibly organic. So if you listen to the show, because I, uh, when I was an undergrad, I interned at a radio station. So I got to see you know, how radio was produced. Okay? Right. I, I was, so I was an intern for a local radio talk show host. And so I got to see how the whole thing worked. And then I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, like the radio shows that I listen to, or if you like, just watch Frasier. I mean, if you watch the show Frasier, because, you know, Frasier had uh, Roz, yes. you know, the snarky producer that would be off to the side and would occasionally turn on the mic and banter with the host. And depending on what show you listen to, some hosts, you could even hear the, you know, hear the oh producer. You would just hear silence. 
and then the host would talk back, you know? So I was thinking about this, like, I should do that, something like that. So it'd be like, how about this? How about this? It's the Monster Island Film Ball, which is a title I've been sitting on for a while. And then I said, how about I say that the podcast is actually a radio show on Monster Island? So, like, think, destroy all monsters, okay? And so, like, yeah. but now in, like, the 20 years since 1999 when the movie took place, like they've actually it's turned into Jurassic Park, basically, you know, they have built a resort and there's a scientific facility. And, you know, there are people who are coming to visit all the time. It's this big tourist trap business. OK, because it's in a real location, Ogasawara. Mm -hmm. And so I said, how about I say they established a radio station? It's like a little radio station that goes out to, you know, that everybody on the island can listen to and things like that. And then they put out their broadcast as podcast episodes, you know, because I know that that was becoming more common at the time. So and then I'll have an on mic producer. It was originally just going to be silence, and then I would just talk back. I sent the rough, the first cut of that first episode to some podcasting friends to get feedback, and they said, "Jimmy, I'll get to where Jimmy comes from in a moment." They said, "Jimmy needs a voice." So I'm like, "Okay, what do I do?" Well, here's the thing: Jimmy on the show. A lot of people don't realize this. He's technically a legacy character. He is from a semi-obscure Toho movie called The War in Space, which is what we talked about on the live stream last night. It was basically Toho trying to make Star Wars. That's the gist of yeah. it. And <laughs> Jimmy, just character of Jimmy, doesn't even have a last name. He's just Jimmy. <laughs> he was you know, the token white guy in this movie. <laughs> and see, and that's I, what... That's what makes me nerd out because what you're doing is your world, you're taking yes. this long form creative project and you're doing world building around. I know. It. Yeah. So when I had just watched the war in space, I think within a year of this, okay, I tracked it down uh, thinking I was going to podcast about it at some point. I knew nothing about the movie going into it other than Toho trying to make star Wars. That's all I knew. Okay. <laughs> so I'm watching it. And my brother, my younger brother, Jared, was watching it with me. He will vouch for this. <laughs> I got weirdly attached to Jimmy. Watch, if you haven't, Donnie, I I've highly seen, recommend watching. I've seen bits and pieces. I okay. know enough so, to know Jimmy. Yes. So when Jimmy first appears in the movie, he's, he's not at the start. When Jimmy first appears, they are building a super duper spaceship to go stop the alien invaders on an island. And the aliens are trying to raid it to try to keep them from finishing the sh uh, con construction of the ship. And Jimmy flies in on an F4 Phantom. His ship, his airplane gets shot by the alien ship, by the alien ships. He parachutes down and then gets the parachute off and then starts running around dodging laser blasts until he comes to a cliff. And then he just jumps off the cliff, dives into water. We cut to the next scene. He's soaking wet, taking his helmet off because I guess he swam to the underground base <laughs> somehow. Oh <my> <laughs> and then, uh, and then, because he had been name dropped a couple of times earlier on in the movie and then the Japanese characters see him and they're like, Jimmy! And I'm like, that's Jimmy? Jimmy is awesome. And then, and then in that <laughs> moment, the stars aligned for the yeah, transformation. But then, yeah, but then the funny thing was, is spoiler warning, Jimmy dies. <laughs> so, th so through the podcast, you've preserved the legacy. Of I this have. Character. That was because that was originally the joke. I said, this is Jimmy from NASA, because I thought that's what they called him. They actually said Jimmy at NASA. So but the moniker stuck once I realized I got it, it a little bit off. It worked. It <laughs> yeah. worked. No. So I said, this is Jimmy from NASA, my producer, who miraculously survived the infamous war in space, but he won't tell me how. <laughs> Whenever you hear him, he just sounds like a garbled robot voice. But the joke is, I understand what he's saying, and my guests understand what he's saying, but no one he listening understands <laughs> what he's saying. So the explan in the in universe explanation is that his mic is messed up. <laughs> See, like those t like tidbits like that, I think really make content wholesome. Like especially if it's a long form right. content, right? And I love right. that. So you you've mentioned some of the Godzilla films that you've really delved into. I want to know about some of the kaiju that have developed into your favorites and some of the human characters too. Right. Right. I did. I wrote a handful down. We talked about Jet Jaguar already. That was on my list. 
Yeah. And uh, just to let you know, some of the other movies that I have been really gravitating toward, because I made a list of that too. So Terror still remains one of my favorites. And I also really like Godzilla versus Gigan. I know that might sound a little yes. bit weird, but I think Godzilla versus Gigan is grossly underestimated. There oh, is a I think lot so more too. going on in that movie than oh, people I think realize. So too. That's a whole discussion unto itself. Uh, I am also a fan of Godzilla 2000 because I got to see it in a theater. I also really like Godzilla 1984, Return of Godzilla. Not so much the Americanized version, because once I saw the Japanese version, I'm like, this is so much better. Oh, yeah, for sure. And without getting too much into it, what I really like about it, it's the the English major in me coming out, is it's a perspective on the Cold War that I don't think we get to see very often, because when we see films or you know his you know documentaries or whatever just information about the cold war it's almost always either from american or soviet perspectives this is done from the perspective of a country who's not a superpower and is mm -hmm. caught in the middle yeah. has loyalties more toward one than the other because obviously the japanese are like we don't like the soviets <laughs> mm -hmm. so we're we like the americans more but the americans are trying to push us around a little bit which is what makes it that movie absolutely just fascinating oh, and, yeah. and that's a whole that, other level of tension to it that yeah and the, that fact the american that, version doesn't have yeah it doesn't have it. and the fact that they go full tilt villainization with the Amer with the soviets in the american cut when originally it wasn't like that, I think, again, it takes away from mm -hmm. the very Japanese perspective that it offered. And I know it's not a Godzilla film, but one of my all-time favorite kaiju movies, honestly, Donnie, is Gamera 3. I adore the Heisei Gamera trilogy, oh and Gamera God. 3 is my favorite of the three. Okay, so I literally, I'm trying to remember, was I talking to Danny DeMann about this? I think that the Gamera trilogy, when, in the grand scheme of kaiju films, like come to, it's just comprised of like some of the best, most wholesome, memorable kaiju film moments ever. And like, I'm nerding out that you love that film because yeah, I, I and and that's a good transition for us to go back to the question you were asking because Heisei Gamera and Asagi are on that list of characters in kaiju that I really, really like. In fact, I got to meet a, meet a Yako Fujitani just a few weeks ago oh my god it uh almost At Alma, attack and you know what's insane donnie that was the first time she had ever been to a convention anywhere really that really surprises me I, that surprised me too and i'm like you've got to be kidding me you had to have had offers. I'm sure G Fest has tried at least six times oh my god. or 1, something thousand percent yeah yeah or you know like conventions in Japan or something and, I'm, and the, this humble little first year con that's just a spinoff of a horror convention you came for that my mind is wow, that's so <laughs> that's so interesting to and me. she's she's a lovely wonderful woman let me tell you yeah like when I saw people meeting her and, and, and seeing all the photos I was just like I should have gone to this. there's a lot of things to love about the Heisei Gamera trilogy but I th the reason I love Asagi so much is that it's Kaneko taking that incredibly silly trope from those old Gamera movies. I know I don't want to take the nostalgia or the love that people have for those old Gamera movies from them, but you have to understand I started with Guardian. I had never watched the, the old Showa stuff because it just didn't seem appealing to me. And then, you know, except for MST3K, but MST3K makes everything better. Oh, for sure. yeah. <laughs> I have that set, by the way. It's no, wonderful. Like, it's interesting that you mentioned this because I just watched the Showa Gamera sh movies, aside from like the first film. I watched the rest of the Showa Gamera movies for the first time this summer. And I was just, I was like, I spent most of the time being like, what's happening? <laughs> Children are stealing a flying saucer and somehow. Um, it's and one of them was Jimmy, by the way. <laughs> like the kid in virus the american kid in virus carl craig really official mifv lore that was little jimmy <laughs> well that really boosted my like intrigue into the character so asagi is just wonderful because she is that trope but actually implemented well. It's not crazy to think that a teenage girl, not a little kid, but a teenage girl can connect with a kaiju like she does. And right. she becomes this 
this go between this conduit, this priestess, as they put it, for Gamera. And she has this arc throughout the whole trilogy. And she it, it, not only that, but Gamera does. Gamera has a, a mm -hmm. kaiju has a character arc in a movie trilogy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And it, it's in large part because of what Asagi does, because Asagi helps to humanize Gamera, remind him that it's not just the earth he's fighting for. There are people that he needs to be mindful of as well. And like that last scene in Gamera three in the train station before he goes off to fight the Gauss, it's just, yeah, that film, it gets me that film. I'm so grateful. That's it's, it's basically turned into like a cult classic of sorts. When you think about it, like a whole trilogy, but the mm. fact that it ended in such an ominous yet really suspenseful way like it really no kaiju film to my memory has done that listen to my episodes on the trilogy <laughs> if i have the uh, kim is on for gamera three so you'll get some you know some more familiar voices on there uh and i also love gamera the brave i'm one of the weirdos who loves gamera the brave apparently i just watched that for the first time too and really enjoyed it yeah. no like, okay so i nerded out because okay we all know that I love Mothra, right? I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think it was common knowledge, um, but <laughs> the actress that plays Mull in the Mothra trilogy plays the mother of the child main, mm -hmm. and I was just like, "What?" So like, I was like freaking out. I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like, I love her. She's uh -huh. my icon. She's mm -hmm. fleeting in it, but you know, hey. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really enjoyed that film. I thought I think mm -hmm. that film is very underrated too. Yeah, I agree. And then just, you know, to a few more kaiju and characters. I love Angerus. Angerus has been probably my second favorite kaiju. Well, he was my second favorite kaiju for a really long time. I just love his attitude. He's right. like, I can't breathe fire. I walk on all fours. But you know what, Ghidorah? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, like just such like a fierce. Like, I, I think Angerus has gone down in history as like being Godzilla's most loyal dedicated ally right mm -hmm. and i just i love that so much mm -hmm. yeah that. like i said it's just that never say die attitude the i don't care if i'm out yeah i completely outmatched i am still going to win this he's the ultimate underdog he's like the rocky of kind oh my god yeah. so <laughs> let me talk about childhood trauma um uh -oh. <laughs> sorry so, no 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 like I, I kind of have mentioned this before in the show but like I have always loved Angiris, but like the the scene that really scared the hell out of me as a kid when when Mechagodzilla breaks his jaw. Oh, no. oh. Like I remember like that was my first Godzilla film. Oh like, no. <laughs> like I saw Angiris and I was just like, oh, like what a cute spiky dinosaur thing. <laughs> and then suddenly, like in the next scene, it's like Jaws getting ripped off by the character who I thought was so as a kid, I was so confused. I was just like, I was like, what's happening? And to this day, I'm just like, this, that was an intense scene. And I feel so, like, there's a character that I feel bad for always. It's Ingeris. Always. 